sincere honor and pleasure to welcome Vivian Manass to uh, our next up series of Business 201. Uh, Vivian is Senior Principal and Architect at uh, Manass Skyzek, as well as an accomplished architect and green building pioneer. Uh, since joining, uh, since founding uh, Manass Skyzek uh, in uh, 1997, Vivian's deeply collaborative design approach and passion for sustainability have transformed the Canadian green building industry. Today, she is widely recognized as one of the top, the country's top green architects and integrated design facilitator. So, uh, I think as part of our discussion, let's kick it off by saying, um, you know, how did you, how did you first uh, look at um, maybe <coughs> your path to where you are now, mm -hmm. and uh, what, what, what were the opportunities that you saw in terms of sustainability? Yeah, well, thanks very much, uh, and welcome. Uh, great to be here. Um, there, there were lots of different paths along the way, but I have to say, you know, when I was in architecture school back in uh, the 1970s, was at the time of the first energy crisis. And you guys may not remember this, but some people might. Um, around that time, the whole question of how um, architecture and how the built environment um, is impacted by and impacts the physical planet that we live on was very much a topic of conversation. And so many of us at that time started to talk about sustainability as being a really important uh, aspect of what we do as architects. It became clear, I think, to myself and to many of my classmates and colleagues that although that was a discussion at school and as students, it really wasn't much of a discussion in the world of architectural practice. And so I think when I got out of school, it was, it was clear that it, there was a long ways to go in integrating sustainability and sustainable design thinking uh, into the world of architectural practice. So it seemed like there was an opportunity there to see how, how that could become uh, a niche or a new way of looking at architecture in, in going forward. So when you were blazing the trail, uh, how you know, when, when you're, you're dealing with the, the businesses that require a new building, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, your, your background, uh, you know, you have to get all of the stakeholders kind of aligned. Mm -hmm. um, how easy was, was, was it to do that? Or, or what, what, who were some of the, were, were there other Edmonton companies that were, um, that were really kind of seeing that this is very proactive, or was it some, something that you had to do outside of the city? <clears throat> it, it was actually, interestingly enough, a question of trying to figure out um, where the market really might be, who might actually be interested in the world of sustainable design. So that was one of the early things that we discovered is that there's lots of ways to figure out who your client is, who your audience is, or who your market is. And one was actually uh, to you know pick this topic, the sustainable buildings topic that we thought was so important. And uh, what we did was we held a, a conference on sustainable buildings. It's called the Sustainable Building Symposium. And it also is going to be going into its 20th year this coming year in, in, in 2017. So we started that conference in 1997. And that was partly to sort of see who in the world might be interested. And we thought, well, if we could sort of bring people from other parts of the world who were doing interesting stuff, we could create a conversation about green buildings, about sustainability, about sustainable design, and see whether you know there was interest locally. So showcasing best practices was really the path we chose. And what we discovered was that amongst all the different client groups that we could be talking to, the most sort of innovative and the most willing to um, pursue green building strategies uh, were actually the smaller municipalities. So the town of Banff was one of our early clients and the town of Hinton was one of our early clients and <clears throat> the, the town of Airdrie. And so a lot of the smaller municipal governments around the province were really the early adopters. It took us a while to figure that out, um, but once we figured it out, we sort of knew where our, where our niche was and we continued to uh, talk to that particular segment of the market in that community. And so whenever there was a new town hall, a city hall, a library, a police station, those kinds of buildings, um, community tended to be interested, municipal governments tended to be interested, actually to the point where um, by about uh, 2000, 
2000, we managed to get the city of Calgary interested, and they actually instituted a green building policy uh, in the early 2000s. And so that was kind of what we did, was we introduced this idea that green buildings were a good idea and good for people, the planet, and the bottom line. And then we started to encourage people to adopt policy around that to uh, basically to in ensure that it wasn't just about us, it wasn't really about just our firm being able to design green buildings, but it was also about the world needing green buildings. So we were sort of working both sides of that, the public policy side as well as the, the business side of it. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of the, particularly if you're, if you're dealing with more of the governments and that there might be an easier sell because they can see the longer term impacts. Mm -hmm. But on the business side, um, did you get any, any pushback in terms of, you know, the idea that this would be costly and that it may not have a payback? Well, interestingly enough, as I said, we sort of went through and identified who the early adopters would be. And frankly, the commercial building owners are always late adopters. Okay. So we didn't really worry about them. It's only now, 20 years later, that the commercial sector is starting to get the green buildings agenda. But the private sector is always a late adopter. People think that the private sector is an innovator. And in real estate, that's rarely the case. It usually is the public sector that is the innovator and the private sector that follows. Because they, they have to be very conservative. They have to do what's proven. Right. Um, public sector can take more uh, of a long view and look at what might be good in the future. Um, private sector and real estate tends to be very, very short-term returns on investment focus. So um, they don't tend to look at the long term until they absolutely have to. So it's only now that we're doing work with private owners. And private owners have never really been part of our market. And we have 10 different market segments that we work in as a firm, yeah. and the private sector is only one of those 10, right. and really doesn't constitute a, a whole um, large proportion of Well, there's, there's two kinds of private owners. I mean, there are many kinds of private owners, but there are two sort of general kinds of private building owners. Um, there's corporate owners who build for themselves, and that group are very much more aligned with long-term, what's good for their own staff, what's good for their own organization. And then there's developer owners who build for, for commercial purpose, and that's a very different kind of reality. In terms of, of the, uh, the, your, your firm, mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering uh, you know, how, when, when somebody comes to work for you, uh, the motivation factor, mm -hmm. how do you keep them engaged, uh, and how do you make it fun for them? Like, mm -hmm. We all like to do things uh, that are valuable, we all mm -hmm. want to have the values, and. To, to do something that we're really, uh, you know, think that we're a part of something that is mm -hmm. important. Uh, but the fun side, how do you how do you encourage uh, your employees to to take advantage of, of opportunities? Well, I, I think for one thing, I think our firm does a lot of really great sort of extracurricular uh, activities. So we have an annual ski trip. We have yoga classes twice a week. We have an in-house chef. We have lots of good activities for people to be involved in. But largely, you know, the reason people are involved is because they align with the values. So we, we tend to attract young architects, engineers, other graduates from um, universities. It's very self-selecting and, you know, truthfully, we're, we're very selective in who we are able to hire. So we have a, a long list of people who would love to come work for us and we can only, we only have enough work for a certain number we have a staff of about 50 people here in Edmonton and another half a dozen in Calgary. Um, and we're about to open an office in uh, Romania, in Bucharest, in Eastern Europe. So, uh, but you know, that's a, still a relative, by architectural firm standards, that's a pretty big firm. But by business standards, it's a pretty small business. Right? So, um, why Romania? Uh, what was the impetus? Uh, like, you think, uh, it's kind of, uh, maybe there's opportunities there because of a uh, former Eastern Bloc country and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that's exactly right. There are opportunities there, and I think nobody's really doing green buildings there yet. So um, it happened that there were two young architects from Romania who came and worked with us for a couple of years here in Edmonton, and uh, they're terrific, and they decided to go back, so we decided to open an office with them. But it really is 
it depended on having the right people in the right place at the right time. And uh, so we had the right team available and uh, they are aligned with our values and they could see an opportunity again in the marketplace uh, for doing something that doesn't really exist there. Do you have like uh, a program where you bring maybe some interns in to, uh, that, that you uh, that, that can have spend time with your, your firm and then go back out and that you have relationships with? Is that part of a... Well, very much so. And, uh, you know, the couple of the schools of architecture actually have co-op programs. So we hire out of the co-op program. So those students might come and spend, you know, a four-month or an eight-month work term with us. Uh, or a summer, you know, for some of the universities that don't have um, co-op programs. We tend to hire more senior students. So, you know, they might be in their, you know, close to final year, kind of heading into their thesis um, stage of their, of their training. And um, so then, you know, if we get along well and we like one another, then there's a good chance that they come back and join us after they graduate. We've talked about the value side of it. And um, how do you, how are you able to, to, you know, share the values with, um, with your employees and, and you know, get them to buy into it. Are they, are you, uh, is it something that you look for at the beginning, right yeah, when, to, you know, whether they... To a large extent, it's self-selecting. We, we basically hire people who share values, and usually people who care about green buildings and sustainability and the quality of life. Um, frankly, those values are fairly widespread amongst architectural graduates, so there's, quite a few students who would feel that that would be a great place to work. And I think we we practice what we preach, which I think is what people appreciate. Uh, we have a couple of questions that I can ask that our students have, have asked. Okay. Um, sure. So we talked a little bit about you know some of the things you're doing uh, outside of Edmonton, Romania. What projects have, been, have you been involved in, both inside and outside of Edmonton? Well, currently we're uh, working on the new McCune University Center for the Arts. That's just down the street here. We're doing that in collaboration with a Vancouver-based firm. And uh, that's under construction, as you know, as you've seen. And uh, so that's exciting. Uh, we completed uh, PCL Construction's new North American headquarters on 99th Street. You might see that one as you drive up and down 99th Street in the city. Um, we've. Um, just completed an addition and renovation for the Edmonton Community Foundation. We're currently working with Boyle Street uh, Co-op, which is a community services agency that serves uh, homeless people, trying to help them to redevelop their new facility, which is actually also just a block away from here, um, just on 105th Avenue. Um, we were, we're working on a number of school projects around the province. There's two schools under construction in Calgary and uh, two under construction in the greater Edmonton area. Uh, university buildings, we worked on Athabasca University's new center, um, academic research center. And um, in Calgary, we worked on the Calgary Water Center, uh, on the Calgary Emergency Operations Center. So a whole wide cross section mostly, uh, say, municipal government, provincial government, federal government. Um, we did the Greenstone Government of Canada building in Yellowknife a number of years ago, and uh, the Eastgate office building for Environment Canada here, uh, more recently here in the city. A uh, lot of sort of high-end commercial office buildings, the Service Credit Union, their corporate head office, uh, St. John Ambulance, their uh, provincial headquarters. So a good range of educational and office type of environments. Two of those that you talked about were kind of non-profits that uh, mm -hmm. have a real community engagement mm -hmm. piece, like mm -hmm. the Edmonton Community Foundation mm -hmm. um, and uh, Boyle Street. Boyle Street. Yes. Yeah. So uh, being, you know, uh, part of the community, how, mm -hmm. you know, do you, does that, uh, does that really, um, you know, being able to provide services to those type of organizations, is that part of the mandate that you, you see? Or? It is, absolutely. And, and actually what we've done is we've started a thing called the Blue Sky Award. And every year um, in the spring, we advertise to all the nonprofits and we invite them to compete for uh, $10,000 worth of free design services. So we get submissions from uh, pretty much across the province. There's usually 20 to 30 different agencies that submit 
uh, an expression of interest, and it's just a simple application, two pages, so it's not onerous for them to, to apply. Um, and uh, we select the winner or winners each year, and uh, we try to select sort of one in northern Alberta, one in southern Alberta when we can. And um, for example, one of our Blue Sky Award winners was the Skills Society, which uh, just opened a new action lab very recently. You might have seen that on Twitter if you were following uh, the nonprofit sector on, uh, on Twitter recently. They just had the grand opening a week ago. Uh, so we do lots of different kinds of projects in the nonprofit sector, and a lot of it is because uh, we made this commitment to this Blue Sky Award, and we've been doing that for about five years now. And uh, of course, not all the projects we're working on are part of the Blue Sky Program, but uh, the Blue Sky Program gives people an opportunity uh, to, you know, get some uh, pro bono assistance. And uh, of course, we can't do everything pro bono because we still have <clears throat> to make ends meet. So other nonprofits just come to us and recognize that we share values and we can help them uh, plan, design, and construct their projects. Uh, one of the, the, you know, when we talk about the Community, Community Foundation, uh, they have a social enterprise kind of group. That's uh, right. Group. They do. And uh, thinking about that, um, you know, what do you, uh, you're a, an advocate of social enterprise mm -hmm. and social entrepreneurship. Very much so. Very much so. And, you know, some people would argue that uh, architectural practices are all social enterprises. Uh, and I would certainly say that our, uh, our firm would be categorized as a social enterprise, although we don't call it that, but it certainly is that. Um, so we, we say that, you know, we, uh, or we are an organization that is for purpose rather than for profit. And I think that's how you distinguish. I mean, you still have to make money to pay the bills, but um, your focus is on the purpose of the organization rather than on, you know, shareholders' um, returns. And, um, so certainly the Social Enterprise Fund that's at Edmonton Community Foundation is one we're very familiar with and we work a lot with Jane Bisbee and her team over there to help some of our clients uh, get funding from that fund where appropriate. So sometimes um, there's projects that can be assisted by some of the investment dollars that are available through that particular channel. Mm -hmm. So what, what role do you see like a, a business school like uh, McEwen? for our Bachelor of Commerce program mm -hmm. uh, in social enterprise. Where, mm -hmm. where do you think we could go with that? Well, uh, that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, understanding how to work in that nonprofit sector, uh, in that social enterprise sector, is a really different kind of reality. And I think for students uh, to become familiar with the challenges of working in that particular sector, um, I think is of great value because there are lots of jobs in that sector um, and there are lots of opportunities to make things happen. Um, in many ways, the challenges in the nonprofit sector um, include that it's a much more politicized world and so the kind of uh, courses that you might take and the kind of awareness that you might build around capacity to work in that sector um, might be a broader base of sort of understanding the political landscape. So uh, what about uh, volunteer opportunities in terms of, you know, getting into that environment, do you think students would be uh, well suited to, to take their, what they're learning here and, and provide that with uh, voluntary organizations? Oh, I would think so, I would think so. I think that there are lots of the organizations that would love to have students assist on a volunteer basis. Um, and many of the nonprofits around our region have an excellent volunteer management program. And in fact, McEwen even teaches that, right? Volunteer management was right. something that they, used to be in, I don't know if it's still around, but. We had a, yeah, we had a, a, a diploma program doing that, but uh, right now Leo's got a course on nonprofit uh, management. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. that would be a good opportunity to, to take that and, and to provide skills in the community where when you graduate, I think, you know, you could Yeah, and, and understanding board governance and understanding the, the reality of the nonprofit sector. In some ways, it's not that different than the business sector. In other ways, it's very, very different. And yourself, I know you're, you give time to uh, 
I know you're on the McEwen uh, Business Advisory Board, and uh, you're probably other. You're uh, probably give your time to other nonprofit uh, mm -hmm. activities mm -hmm. as well. That's right. Yeah, I've been over the years. I've been on the on the board and as president of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. I've been on the board then of uh, Edmonton Economic Development. I've been on the board of the Canadian Green Building Council. So lots of lots of different nonprofits and, and board involvement for sure. Uh, we have a couple more questions uh, from our students. Um, now, one of them is a very interesting question about uh, any challenges that you you face being a woman in a leadership position, and if so, how did you overcome them? And any advice you would have to mm -hmm. somebody that wants to be uh, maybe a female in leadership? Yeah, no, good question, and, and very much so. It's it is a, a challenge. Uh, I think in some ways women have always just sort of set themselves up to be better than everybody else. And so if you're better enough, then there's no more barriers. But there are still barriers for sure. Um, I think women do have to work harder and prove themselves. Uh, I think being connected, being in the community, knowing people, uh, using your networking skills is a big part of how you succeed, both as a guy or as a girl. But certainly, um, you know, if you have those strengths, you know, use them <clears throat> and uh, get to know people and get to know where the opportunities are uh, and where you can where you can help, where you can fit it fit in. Um, do you have a, a large social media presence in terms <coughs> of not only your your company but yourself? And how do you manage that? Um, you know, I, I tend to um, be more active under the company banner rather than as personal. Banner, so I, I'm on Twitter as Manask Isaac. Um, so you can check us out on Twitter. We're usually pretty active um, there. We have a Facebook page that is managed by one of our staff. Uh, we're somewhat active on Instagram, not so much. Uh, and certainly our website is kept up to date in terms of you know where we're what we're up to in terms of our projects and our and our uh, environmental commitment as well. Do you encourage your employees to also <coughs> be proactive and to show, you know, that, that side of, of uh, the, the community, let's say? Oh, very, very much so, very much so. We absolutely encourage all of our team members to be active in the community at one level or another. We have staff members who, you know, are on their community leagues, are on their, on the Development Appeal Board, on uh, the board of the Opera, on, you know, anything that you're passionate about we absolutely encourage people to get out in the community because that's the only way that you really get to know what's going on in town and get to know um, who's doing what and that's how you find out where the where the opportunities are but also how you can be of service. Um, another student question that we have is, you made comments about the short-term vision of developers potentially. Um, would you agree that there's a need for companies like your own who are thinking long term as well as companies who are focused on be being opportunistic in the uh, short term? Oh yeah, I think there's there's need for all of the different kinds of organizations <clears throat> and they just have different profiles. So, um, I think that all, you know, each kind of organization has its own reality. And I think the important thing is to be able to distinguish between them. So to know who you are as, a, as an organization and what your values are and what your agenda is and to be clear on that. <clears throat> and neither is good, bad, or indifferent. It's just as long as you know that they're not all the same. And it's kind of difficult to just compare, you know, somebody whose primary mandate is very short term versus somebody whose primary mandate is very long term. As long as you know that they're very different, that's the key. It's not to say that one's right and one's wrong and one's better and one's worse. They're just very different. Uh, another student <coughs> question that we have is, what specifically is green in terms of uh, Manesque Isaac's architecture? Hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, when we think about architecture, um, at the highest level, we think about creating buildings that are healthy for people and the planet. So that's sort of at the highest level how we think about it. What that means is that 
Um, in terms of buildings that are healthy for people, uh, that means the indoor air environment, the quality of materials, and it's everything from you know, using non-toxic paints as opposed to toxic paints or non-toxic adhesives in the ceilings or what kind of wood you specify, what kind of upholstery you use, not specifying vinyl. So eliminating toxicity in the indoor environment, uh, good ventilation, access to fresh air and sunshine, windows that open, um, lots of daylight. So all of the human health dimensions are really important. <clears throat> and then in terms of what's good for the planet, of course we need to reduce our carbon footprint because our planet isn't happy with us for the amount of carbon that we're sending out there. So um, we need to uh, reduce the amount of energy we use. We make our buildings very sustainable by making them very energy efficient. But also we need to pay attention to water, how much water we consume. So we have to design buildings that consume less water, uh, lots of ways to do that. Everything from what kind of toilets you specify to how you uh, select the landscaping uh, so that it doesn't need irrigation. So, so we look at basically um, energy, air, um, water, uh, indoor environmental quality, and then, um, and then we also look at things like um, on-site energy generation. So everybody talks about you know solar or wind or whatever, and that's of course necessary. But first, you have to reduce the amount of energy that your building needs. So we think about it as a sort of a reuse, reduce, recycle kind of a thing. The old three R's. Um, so reduce the amount of energy that we need for our buildings. Add on-site generation like solar. Uh, and uh, you know, more recently, our buildings are essentially net zero. Uh, energy, and that's sort of the, d the direction that we're heading in, is to, to make new buildings and renovated existing buildings um, focus on using no more energy than they can generate on site. So when you talk about uh, taking an existing building mm -hmm. and retrofitting it mm -hmm. so versus building a new building, are there additional challenges in terms of that? Is it typically more costly? Well, you know, there are additional challenges, but actually it isn't more costly, despite sort of conventional wisdom. Um, it's actually far less costly for a whole lot of reasons. Um, from an environmental perspective, there's a lot of embodied energy in an existing building. There's a lot of materials, and if you tear down that building, that takes a lot of energy, so you're wasting a lot of energy by ripping down something that already took energy to build in the first place. So from an environmental perspective, we always look at, can we keep an existing building? Is it possible? Um, from, a, from the point of view of um, you know, reusing existing buildings, there's also the fact that you know, those buildings are often occupied. And so if you tear them down, you have to move people out, and then you have to accommodate them someplace else and move them back in. Whereas if you can renovate a building, you can often just keep those buildings in use which is better both financially and functionally. So as architects, we have to pay attention to all of those things, right? We have to look at the sort of short-term, medium-term, long-term uh, aesthetic and financial and environmental impacts of all of the decisions. And so wherever possible, we look at reimagining existing buildings as an alternative to, um, to tearing them down and replacing them. Um, and in terms of, of you know, what you're, you're doing is um, trying to create a community, I guess, that is a livable community that mm -hmm. in, encourages people to, to visit and to, and I think the city is trying to do that right now with the, uh, the expansion of the ice district and all of those opportunities that lie in, in creating a, a heart of the city, I guess, again. Right. Um, so in terms of, of that, I know the McEwen site is, is doing that. Um, how do we encourage people to think like that? Uh, well, I think urbanism is very connected to architecture, for sure, and so study architecture, <laughs> study urbanism, study urban design. Uh, but also, I think, think, keep in mind that there's a social enterprise aspect or social community aspect, so redeveloping our core of our cities uh, is very much needed, and of course, our cities were intact back you know, 50, 70 years ago. Um, they got decimated by some short-term thinking. The key to kind of revitalizing our cities is to think longer term. 
And that includes the social sector. And this is one thing that's really important is that, you know, as we think about social enterprise and the community and the well-being of the community, we have to find a way to integrate both the business interests of groups like, you know, the Cates Group and the ICE District and the community interests for people who live around here and who've lived here for a long time, including people who use the services of agencies like Boyle Street and Missile Center and Hope Mission and so on. And so both are important and we have to encourage our municipal leaders uh, to give equal weight and equal investment on both sides. And sometimes there's a tendency to invest a little more heavily on the on the sort of shiny glitzy commercial side and a little bit less on what's good for the larger community. And that's one of the things that I think we've just seen a little bit of, of you know in, in the news media about some of the dislocations that happen as you uh, as you you know have that rehabilitation of a certain area and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and not thinking about the whole picture or how it's going well, to and that's and that's been very much the history of urban redevelopment in cities across North America. Is you know first we sort of vacated our downtown core in the 60s and 70s and moved out to the suburbs, and then the downtown core became uh, a place for you know those who didn't have elsewhere to go, and now that the downtown core is kind of be, being reclaimed or regentrified. Uh, there is a desire to push people out in some cases, and certainly across North America that's kind of happened. And so I think our challenge here in Edmonton is to, to learn from those lessons and to not do that, uh, and to integrate the needs of people who are homeless and who live on the street and who live uh, have lived in uh, low-income housing for a long time, um, integrate those needs into what's being redeveloped in our downtown uh, and again, that's sort of the job of urban planners, urban designers, um, architects, but also the job of, of the business community to pay attention to that. Um, we have a, a student that might be interested in doing, uh, going in and doing architecture, uh, masters of architecture. Do you have any advice to a commerce student looking to do that? I think you were sure. talking about that in terms of that, that blend between the business side and the yeah, architectural. Yeah, absolutely. There's very definitely uh, a lot of value uh, in having a business background or a business degree to build with an architecture degree. Uh, myself, I actually did an, an MBA after I did architecture, so that's the other way around. But you could certainly do uh, a commerce degree first and then do a master's in architecture for sure. Uh, and if you're thinking about doing that, um, drop by our office at beer time on a Friday afternoon and uh, I'll introduce you to some people who can uh, point you in the right direction. Beer time on a Friday afternoon sounds yeah. like a nice, uh, a nice kind of a way to end the week. Yeah, every Friday around 4.30 it's beer time and uh, we often have students and others uh, visiting, uh, clients drop in sometimes, uh, friends of the family sometimes. We've had a bit of a baby boom in our office, so our new young parents bring their little tiny tykes to visit uh, on Fridays at beer time. So it's quite a, a fun, uh, quite a fun time. So if you're interested, um, look us up. We're easy to find. Manasque Isaac Architects. Uh, the address is on the website. Drop in Friday at 4:30 at beer time. Yeah, you've got the invite now. So that's right. Totally. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, we have one on uh, the bidding process. Uh, if you're a green, you know, if, if you we have that as your embodiment and your values, mm -hmm. that kind of sense of, of green building, mm -hmm. and you're up against some other companies that that might not necessarily mm -hmm. be quoting on that basis. How do you how do you be competitive? Does your green man mandate make it difficult to match bids? Um, well, that's or, an in, yeah. that, that's a really interesting question. Um, Architectural services have historically been seen to be professional services, and although we do compete uh, with our, uh, and it is very tough competition, it's not always price-based competition. Sometimes, and ideally, it's qualifications-based competition. And that's why we try to encourage clients to introduce things like policy around green buildings. So if the city of Calgary, for example, and now the city of Edmonton and the province of Alberta and others, have a policy that say, you know, all of our buildings have to be lead gold minimum, then they're going to evaluate your credentials based on how good you are at doing lead gold. 
rather than um, just what your price is. So the fees shouldn't really, in theory, the fees shouldn't enter into the selection process. Of course, that's not actually true. That's not actually how the world works. So we do have to submit fees, and we have to be competitive. I mean, there's no, there's no question that we have to charge fees that are the same as what our competitors charge. So we just have to be able to do that, and, and we can. Uh, we talked a little bit about you know, the green aspects of, of the actual design, but uh, how does that, you know, when, when you, you actually have a, a builder, uh, like a PCL that you're working with, yeah. uh, how do you ensure that there is uh, some degree of, of sustainability in the way that they build things? Of course. Well, so, so just to clarify, what we do as architects is when we actually start working with a, a client right at the very beginning when the it's just a dream. There's like, well, maybe we'd like a building that would maybe do this or do that. So it's often very, very nebulous when we get involved. And we take that those ideas and we synthesize them and we design, we work through a, a very rigorous design process. And we design and we work with our consulting engineering team and we work with all the user groups and we work with all of the participants in, the, in a process, which could be hundreds of people, to arrive at a set of very, very detailed instructions for, for the builders. And those detailed instructions, sometimes they're called plans and specs, sometimes they're called blueprints and specifications, sometimes they're just called construction documents. Often they're very thick set, very large drawings. So if you've ever been to a construction site, you, go, you can see sort of hundreds of sheets of big drawings and a big thick set of volumes of books that look like the New York phone book of specifications. That's what we produce, that's our deliverable. And then, over the course of construction, we make sure that the contractor's following those rules. So we set the rules for whether it's PCL or Clark Builders or Stuart Olson or Graham, whoever the successful builder is, we work with them and we stay with the project. Our job as architects is to stay with the project through construction, so we have a team on site uh, during every construction project to make sure that we can answer questions, clarify intent, uh, make sure that the contractor is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and uh, if they're not, then we, you know, advise them so that they can correct it. Uh, and uh, a uh, question about um, your how you got into architecture. What, what was the uh, what about architecture caught your attention, and why did you go into it initially? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, you know, I think it was something that just intrigued me from, from a very young age. It just sort of seemed like a really interesting mix of art and science and math and people and philosophy. It's one of those really synthetic fields that covers everything. So uh, whether you like working with people, whether you like working with ideas, uh, whether you're very technically inclined and you like sort of making things, Architecture is the one field that kind of connects all of those ideas together. So I think that's what kind of caught my attention pretty early on. And um, so I just went into it straight out of high school. So back in those days, that's how it went. You know, now it's a little bit of a longer journey, but um, I just went straight out of high school right into CEGEP and then architecture. And it's one of the things we had a previous other chair that came in, uh, or or current chair, um, uh, Simon O'Byrne. Yeah, of course I know and, Simon. You know, of and, course. And he said, you know, one of the things that, that it was something that he really had a passion for, yeah. and he found out that they're even going to pay me for this. I do yeah. for, you know, so I guess that that's part of it is to find a passion that you're looking at, and, and then uh, the work isn't going to be that, uh, that difficult. Well, that, that's right, because our architecture and planning and urban design, all of those fields, they're very, very complex fields, and they are very difficult. So, yeah, you have to definitely love it, otherwise you wouldn't, it's, it's, too, much, it's too much effort, right, to do it without loving it. And our last couple of questions here, I think uh, one of our students might be from Nirlandia, so i uh, just wondering if, you, if your firm is involved with the building in Nirlandia? Nearlandia? No, we're not. It's, uh, where is we so Nearlandia? Up by, it's north of Edmonton, north of Edmonton? Yeah, they just built a school there in 2073. Oh, yeah. It's uh, like an hour and a half north. It's a really small town. Right. 
Yeah, no, unfortunately we didn't get to do that one. And then finally, do you have any advice for students that are looking to, uh, to found something, a startup of some kind, mm -hmm. you know, going from your experience? Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd say if you, uh, if you want to start any kind of enterprise, I think the main uh, thing to start with is know who your customer is. Think about who you're doing it for and sort of really focus on the needs of that um, client or customer. So rather than focusing on what you can offer the world, focus on what a particular client or customer needs and then tailor your, you know, sort of design your enterprise or your business or your offering based on the needs of that particular group of people. That's a great advice and I know our students are uh, in the middle of their Mission Possible project so uh, maybe they can take that forward with uh, you know, their ideas and uh, operations. Great, well best of luck with those projects with your Mission Possible projects. Okay. So thank you Vivian, uh, it's been a great chat uh, here. And, uh, uh,